In this video, I'm going to show you how to buy 1500, have around 1000 development, have completely conquered Japan, and have footholds in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. If that sounds like what you're looking for, and if you're looking to get the achievements that Korea can get, keep watching. After picking your rivals, it's my recommendation that you delete two of your forts. Those in question being the fort in the south, as in my opinion it's quite useless, and the fort on your capital. Having a fort on your capital is usually quite good, though it is costly, and in my opinion not worth it at this point. After this, build a carrack and start building a spy network in Ashikaga. As you might have guessed, instead of other guides that tell you to go north, we're going to be attacking Japan first. And I'll tell you exactly how we're going to do that and win in a second. Make sure to sort out your estates and lower your maintenance as well as mothballing your fort. Then unpause. When possible, you're going to want to get a claim on So, that's the Japanese daimyo that is an island that's off your southern coast. When the carrack is built and you have enough ducats, you're going to want to build a flagship. This will of course be a heavy flagship with the modifiers of fleet morale, engagement width and cannons. Then build up to your force limit with galleys and when these have been built, get an admiral and a general. Before declaring war, be sure to get rid of the estate privilege that gives you a stability hit when declaring war, for obvious reasons. At the start of the war against Ashikaga, you're going to want to land troops on the island of So, the war goal. Once your troops have landed, you now need to establish naval dominance. If you allow the Japanese navies to group up, they will likely defeat you as this is all one big inland sea. However, your two carracks, including your flagship, should make short work of most navies. Usually, they tend to attempt to blockade your coast. This is the perfect moment to go and take out as many ships as possible. This should continue until you've won the Siege of So. By then, you should have naval dominance firmly in your hand, though do be wary, as without this, you're not going to be able to pull off the next part. From here you're going to need to look at the situation in Japan. In the game I'm showing here, Hosokawa, which is usually one of the most powerful Japanese daimyos, has fallen, meaning that our first target, namely that central island that they used to exist on, is going to be a bit trickier to go for. So we're going to focus on the backup, which is the island in the southwest of Japan. This does have a fort, so after landing troops you're going to want to order a naval barrage. You're going to need to take this fort as quickly as possible. If you're struggling with this, then it might be an idea to land a thousand men in the northeast or otherwise try to distract Ashikaga. This may seem difficult, however you must remember that the, most of the daimyos will likely be embroiled in some sort of war against each other at this point. Once you have this island secured, sit tight and go and blockade the rest of Japan. You can lower your army maintenance and sit back as you'll actually be making a lot of money at this point. Additionally, if the year is past 1450, use your admin and diplo power to develop your capital after putting the edict that gives you minus 10% development cost. After having gotten Military Tech 5, start using your military points as well. You're going to want to develop Renaissance in your capital and then embrace it as soon as you can. As a side note, if you want it to stop spreading, you can set your attitude to other nations as hostile, which will slow down the spread. Looking back at the war, you'll likely be around 60% war score at this point. If you would like more war score, then what you can do is allow Japanese troops onto the island and then fight them until you stack wipe them. Be careful though, as if too many troops get onto the island, or if they siege down a province that gives them control of both sides of the strait, you'll likely lose this war. Or at the very least won't get as much out of it. From this war, you're going to want to take the island that you've captured. I personally would not take so, just because it gives you a really easy war goal later on that you can use. Although in the case of the southwestern island, you won't be able to take all of this in one war anyway, so these will do just fine. So after this piece, you're going to want to embrace renaissance, as well as deal with any rebels. One issue that you'll find with conquering Japan is that each province typically has its own rebels. After embracing Renaissance, you can set everyone as hostile, as I mentioned, or you could sell it to Ming, which should bring in a lot of income. I'd also advise at this point getting an admin advisor, as you're going to be spending a lot of admin power. Whilst waiting for the truce to expire, it is at this point that I would advise attacking north into any Jurjan tribe whose allies won't come in. Ming has a tendency to attack Oirat or Korchin which might cause a little bit of chaos, providing you with ample opportunity. Take as much as you want from these wars, but do be ready for when the truce expires. Ashikaga should be weaker in this war. So when the truce expires, declare war, but this time target the other island in much the same way. Again, if there is a capital fort on this island, make sure you artillery barrage it. Additionally, if Ainu comes in in either this or the previous war, you can very easily deal with them for extra war score. As I mentioned, Ashikaga should be a lot weaker in this war. This war will be made easier if you target Ashikagan troops, as this might make several daimyos 
turn rebellious and therefore they will not help Ashikaga. And this is sort of the crux of the strategy going forward. Upon letting a few stacks in, as well as having superior military tech and quite possibly an advisor, you should be free to roam around mainland Japan. This might be quite a grindy war, so be careful of your manpower in previous wars. And don't be afraid to use mercenaries. You'll become the dominant power in the Nippon trade node, which should bring in a significant income. During the peace of this war, you're going to want to focus on weakening Ashikaga, again towards the end of making daimyos rebellious. Additionally, I would also advise looking for provinces with good vassals. Once again, in this playthrough, Hosokawa, which is typically a larger nation within Japan, fell on hard times, enabling me to release them as a vassal and look for a reconquest opportunity. Now here's where it gets a little bit complex. The reason Japan can be conquered so quickly is because of the fact that sometimes you won't be at war with all of the daimyos, meaning you won't have a truce with them. In the example that I'm displaying here, the nation that killed Hosokawa was not in the war against me. This meant that I could instantly declare war on them, bringing in Ashikaga, without me breaking my truce. And it's looking for these opportunities that will enable you to conquer Japan very quickly. In order to do this, look to take provinces that border daimyos that you don't have a truce with or aren't at war with. Additionally, you can declare war on one of these daimyos in order to reset the truce time with Ashikaga if you want to attack them directly. One thing I would not recommend, however, is taking Kyoto until the very last second. This will not transfer daimyos over to you as a vassal, and it means that likely all of them will join a coalition instantly upon being independent from Ashikaga. Whereas simply attacking Ashikaga or simply attacking the daimyos whilst they are a vassal of Ashikaga means that you don't have to deal with several individual nations all building up to a coalition war, as well as the fact that most of the daimyos won't even participate. So having finished off that war, you should be in a position to take exploration ideas. You're going to want to take the first two ideas. This will get you a colonist and also set you in good stead to attempt to get the colonialism institution. With this colonist, you're going to want to start a colony in the Philippines. As soon as it's established, get a claim on the Philippine miners. Simply declare war and go to town. However, be careful of the naval engagements here. Strangely enough, the Philippines should put up more of a naval challenge than the Japanese. And it's a good way to lose a few ships if you're not ready. Additionally, I would highly recommend killing the natives in your colony so that you don't have to deal with uprisings, but still get the plus 20 settler increase. Once again, you do this up until the truce with Ashikaga is over. In this third war, you're going to want to kill as many daimyo as possible. So in the peace, be sure to take as many daimyo capital as possible so that inevitably you're facing fewer and fewer troops each time, just to make things easier. As a side note, you do need to be careful of your manpower as you are going to get a lot of rebellions. It's worth taking a fort in Japan or even building one if you can't annex one outright as the global nature of your empire means that it'll be rather tricky to kill the rebels before they add years of separatism in a province. Looking to the future, you should alternate your expansion in Southeast Asia, Japan and the Jurjan tribes, with the emphasis being in Japan, as this will form a really nice core power base. You should also start harmonizing with the Shinto religion as soon as possible, as this will give you a really nice plus 5% infantry combatability, not to mention the religious unity aspect. From here, I'd also recommend that you do complete exploration ideas, as it does enable you to spawn the colonialism institution and unlocks the new world. However, if this is not your game plan, it might be an idea just to take the first idea of expansion ideas in order to found the Philippine colony. When you're sufficiently powerful enough around the 1500s and have a tech advantage against the Ming, wait for them to enact a decree as this will drop their mandate below 50. This happens quite often and provides a huge debuff to their troops, meaning you should have no issues marching into Beijing, which will cause further mandate loss. So that about sums up the guide. Thank you guys for watching. Please do subscribe and turn on notifications as it really does help us out. Also, be sure to leave a comment as I really do enjoy hearing your thoughts on these strategies. Goodbye.